Good afternoon. Welcome to the chronic absenteeism webinar that the DOE is conducting today. We're hopeful that you will find the answers that you're looking for and hopeful that you'll get any information that you've been seeking. So without further ado, um, we'll let you know that you are muted right now. If you do have a question, we ask that you put it in the chat box or hold your question to the end when we can provide ans answers to those questions at one single time rather than interrupting the presentation. So without further ado, let's get going. So why do we collect chronic absenteeism? So as many of you know, chronic absenteeism is a new data set that Maine DOE has been collecting. Um, the prior, primary reason why we collect it is research has shown that there's a direct correlation between school absence and school achievement. And typically in the past couple of years, we've, um, well, multiple years, we've collected average daily attendance, which now we've realized really masks chronic absenteeism. So yes, we can see the general number of students that are in attendance daily, but we can't see those students that are missing any number of given days, albeit for um, excused absences or unexcused absences. And then chronic absenteeism is also a component of Maine's model for school improvement, so part of Maine's accountability model. So that's another reason why we've also started collecting that data. So how is it used? As mentioned before, it's part of Maine's accountability model and determinant support. So it is the initial filter that will be used um, for including all schools in Maine within the accountability model. We examine the number of students missing 10% or more of enrolled school days. And then we take that individual student number and it's then aggregated into a school chronic absenteeism percentage. And that's what we utilize. And then chronic absenteeism, though, cannot get you independently identified for school support. So it's one of four filters that will be used in identifying schools for support but it will not get you on or off the list, per se. So what relationship does chronic absenteeism have to the comprehensive needs assessment? A lot of questions have come in regarding what it means um, to be approaching chronic absenteeism. So essentially, we've defined that as any student that is missing between 5 to 9% of enrolled school days would be um, approaching chronically absent. And the intent of recording that data is to try and make the correlation between attendance and achievement of students, um, identify those students that may be at risk of becoming chronically absent, so then missing 10% or more of their school days, and also to analyze the data for those students that are missing between 5 and 9% of school days to determine root cause regarding the reasons why they're missing school and then to develop action steps to address attendance um, broadly across the school district and the school itself. So this is Rick Bergeron. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've learned from the preliminary data set from 1617 that we collected and um, going forward. So basically, like Jeanette had mentioned, that ADA, ADM, we, that we calculated in previous years called aggregate daily attendance, aggregate daily membership, mask the att any attendance issues. So we have also learned by looking at the data that many different schools and districts have different policies on how they determine attendance uh, between the schools. Um, common issues that we found, we found a lot of people submitting half days, 0.5s, and our definition of attendance slightly changed. Basically, a student is in attendance if they are there for more than for half or more of their scheduled school day. So if a student is scheduled a normal traditional school day, if they're there half the day, they're there as a one. If they're less than half, it is a zero. There are no point fives. So it's either one or zero. Um, we've also found that some it's, a, it's the student's scheduled school day. So if you have a senior that's coming in just for one class, a senior English, just in order to get his credits to graduate, as long as they're there for half of that class or more, they are in attendance. It's not the whole 
scheduled hours of the day. It's just the, the student's scheduled school day. And the other thing we found in, in looking at this data is that when you compare it to truancy, um, we found some irregularity. So last year with infinite campus submission, we only collected two fields, number of days of membership, number of days present. Um, this year with Synergy and going forward, we're collecting three data points, membership, days present, and also number of days of excused absences. So in theory, we could actually subtract the number of ex excused absences from the number of absences and be able to determine if by the student's grade and age, if there should be a truancy incident that's also recorded in the, in the truancy module. So we are going to be doing cross-checking on that, and you may be receiving some calls from our help desk um, that we're looking at the 17-18 data that is currently being uploaded um, to try and, and fix some of those um, issues. So we have a website that has a lot of frequently asked questions, and it, it's right there on off the, it is located off the help desk page. And these gives you a lot of the frequently asked questions. It also tells you how to upload data into Synergy and gives you examples. And I guess Travis is going to uh, talk about this part next. So um, we're going to, basically when we're talking about entering the data, there's two ways to enter it into the Synergy system. That's either by upload or by manually entering it. And we have these links provided here. I'm going to actually drop this. I hate doing it this way. But, um, what was the first one I said? So one of the first links will bring you right to the student data page where we have the uh, attendance reporting. And underneath that, you'll see that we have manual entry and how to do it by upload. Also, we have a sample file. So entering manually, you'll go into the school. Make sure you're focused on the school. That's one of the biggest um, errors that we're finding is people are going in just focused on the district and they can't get into the um, attendance in order to make, make that change. Once you're in there, you'll go to the pad tree. When you click on the pad tree, you'll then click on Synergy Sys, then expand student, and then click on student. And at that point, that'll bring you into the area you need to be in to manually enter it. To find the student, you can put in their state ID or their first and last name. Once you've done that, you can get to the enrollment page. Now, if the student is currently enrolled, you'll use the enrollment page. If they've left your district this school year, you'll have to do the same thing, but then go to enrollment history to add the attendance dates. Once they're added, you'll just click Save, and then you can move on. For upload, the biggest thing that we're finding is the fact that people trying to upload with Excel. And that's, that's what we're getting from the help desk. And basically, you have to make sure that it's in CSV or the text format in order to go in. You can see that our sample file is an Excel file, but you can save it once you're done as a CSV. All right. So now... To do the upload, again, you have to focus on the school. Make sure that you have active and inactive students. You'll go to the pad tree. And in this case, you'll go to state reporting, which is under the Synergy SIS, under ME, and then state reporting. In the state reporting field, you'll have a bunch of uh, file types that you can choose from. Of course, we'll choose attendance in this in this situation. Student enrollment should be attendance. And then you'll upload the file. Now, we've had some calls come into the help desk that explain that what they're putting 
into their system, their local student information system, I like to call it SIS because I'm a little lazy, is not what they're getting out from their export. In that case, the help desk isn't uh, going to be able to help uh, much. You'll have to actually talk to Web to School, Power School, or, or Infinite Campus to make sure that the export is working correctly. However, you still should call to make sure that that is the issue. Okay, once you locate your file, you can, you'll click on the upload button that looks like this. Then you'll get a result log. In the results, you'll have a couple of different ones. If everything was successful, you'll have an attendance error log that has nothing and all records are completed successfully. If you do have errors show up in your upload for attendance, um, there are a bunch of different uh, scenarios that cause that, and we have uh, Jess at the help desk who is our go-to person for all uploads. So if you have a question on your upload, why you got a certain error, if you can't figure it out, um, my suggestion is to get a hold of Jess. Here are some common errors, and then you can go to the file and see what those errors were. For instance, this says um, 19 days. Days absence are nine, uh, days enrolled, I'm sorry, I'm reading two lines at the same time. Days enrolled are 260, and we have logic in there that says it can't be over 200. Again, this is where you want to go for all of the uh, information about student attendance. Everything is in here, including everything that Jeanette has talked about, when things are due, and it, that it is a cumulative report. Now, in, in Quarter three, we allowed you to actually certify your attendance without having all your data in. For instance, you had some blanks in your data. However, for the end of the school year, that's not going to be an option. You have to have all student records in for attendance. So basically, once you once you get on the landing page, I'll actually So I'm going to go in real quick just to show you um, student data. So you go to student data, student data reports, I can't find it. There it is. and then student attendance certification, you view report, and once you view report, you'll be given an, uh, an option to see the details that create that report. So what I did was I made this an anonymous spreadsheet so that you could uh, take a look at how to do that the easiest way. So basically, you'd be looking at the total days enrolled. You can see that most of these are 123, which means to me that third quarter was probably done and fourth quarter isn't done yet for this school. But more importantly, there were some errors on the landing page. So to find out what students need to be fixed, in other words, you have to add attendance, membership days and attendance days, you'll just filter on blanks on, on total days enrolled. And this will give you the list of your students that you need to go in and either manually take care of or upload. So it's a real quick way to find out where your errors are, what students they are. Oh, yeah. So the columns going across. Uh, total days enrolled, that is what we call membership days. How, how many days has the student been with you? been the responsibility of your district. Total days present is of those days enrolled, they were sitting in a seat for half a day or more. In lesson like Rick's example, it was a high school student that's only there for one class. It's Was he there for those classes? Then total days absence, and I'm going to actually pull this back up so I can get some numbers. So total days absent, We'll look at this line right here, number six, is 16, of which those 16 days absent, 14 of them are excused in this case. So you're not adding these together. This is the total days absent. This is the number of days excused out of those 16 days. To find the percent absent 
It is taking the 107 and dividing it by the 123, which will give you 13%. It's 16 divided by the 123, not the days present, it's the days absent. And that doesn't excuse that. Correct. Right. And the reason that we have the uh, excused absences here is so that it will tie into truancy. If the student is excused or not excused, it counts towards them not being in a seat or the chronic absenteeism count, which is why we have this total here. This is for truancy purposes. Line I was looking at line 13. Okay. So in this case, Rick's asked me to talk about truancy. So in this case, we have 13 days absent for this student. Only two are excused. So by definition of truancy, um, that student has met the truancy by meeting more than 10 days. I can't tell the grade. Grade 8, yep. So that's correct. <laughs> I want to make sure. Right. So you want to make sure that the truancy incident is in there or that you've corrected the day's excused absences, whatever needs to be done. All right. So now I'm going to put this on. Oh, wow. So chronically absent, there are three things here, an N, a Y, or an E. The N means no, they didn't meet chronically absent. So they're under 10%. The Y means yes, they are chronically absent. They're over the 10%. And E means they're excluded from chronically absent. And that can be met by two ways. Well, three ways, actually. But um, they can be under 10 days membership or total days enrolled with you. Or they are PK or PR for grades. Those are the three ways that they can be exempt. I don't see anybody here, so I can do that. So in this case, all of these students are under 10 days because they're all grades 7 and 8. All right. So now let's go back to this. I gotta start again. Uh, no, just do some cards sure. live. Yeah. This is crazy. What did I do last time? Get that video if you want. I'll just go find it. I said hi. Oh, okay. So um, again, those are the links to get you to the manual and and the uploading process. Uh, all students must have data, even if it was a one-day enrollment. Again, they will be excluded from the count because it's less than 10 days, but we have to have that information in. And as I stated before, you will not be able to certify unless all records have attendance data that, that is um, needed. So I, I kind of quickly went through how to get to the NEO reports, but basically you just go to NEO, student data, and go to student reports and then the student attendance certification. Who is required to report this? All public schools except for CTEs and all private schools for the publicly funded students. Attending districts, um, there's two sections to that. Can I get, I can't, I didn't take a screenshot, darn it. Attending districts are the top piece, and that's basically lists all the students that are attending your district. And this section is what is used to determine chronic absenteeism. The reporting district lists all students who attend out-of-district schools but are your responsibility. And right now, the reporting district summary doesn't include the special purpose private schools or regional programs. But that is in the works uh, to to be there, hopefully, in the next update, so we that we can get data. They're just not viewed on that report. Right. They're just not being viewed on the report. We can see their data. It's just not on the report. Maybe make sure they just did that in the morning. Yeah. 
And so having said that, the SPPS and the regional programs are the ones responsible for putting the attendance data in, and the districts from which they're sending these kids are not supposed to put the data in for attendance. And if they have had it in, if, if you are, for instance, I'm just picking a district out of the top of my head here, RSU 49, and you have kids going to, to um, a special purpose private school, you shouldn't be putting in their attendance. If you did, then you'll have to go in and take the attendance out because the special purpose private school is already taken care of it. To certify attendance data, you have to make sure that all end of the year attendance has been uploaded. And that means your 175 days, 173 days, whatever it is, that you have membership days for all the kids that are enrolled with your school, regardless of they could have been here only for 15 days, that has to be in there. Travis, can I interrupt for one second? Getting back to what he said a moment ago about the, the special purpose private school that putting in the attendance data, if you have a student attending a primary enrollment, and a partial enrollment, that attendance data is entered by the special purpose private. But during that enrollment of the private and of the primary enrollment, if there were any portion of those days where he or she was not in a special purpose private, the primary enrollment should still put in that en enrollment data for when they were there. All right, so then um, once you validate all your students are correct and no students have any missing data, at the bottom of the screen, and actually if there's missing data, you won't see this. This review, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> okay. So the review and submit to DOE will be grayed out until all the data is in. In other words, there are no zeros. If you have a student enrolled, they must have membership, they must have attendance. Or they can be zeros for a one-day enrollment. All right, they just can't be blank. And then Gail, you're up. Okay, hi, uh, this is Gail Erdheim. Uh, just quickly wanted to not leave you with um, nothing but the task of looking at data and scratching your head and wondering what to do. Um, to to support you in your efforts to understand um, your attendance and strategize to improve it, we've put together a resource guide um, that that offers tools for helping you analyze analyze your attendance data, analyze other data in relationship to that attendance data, so you understand why your kids are out, um, and then to choose evidence based. Um, interventions that can help you solve some of the issues that may le be leading your kids to be out. Um, the resource guide will be posted on our attendance and truancy webpage within the next couple of days, um, but if anyone is desperate and needs it before then, um, send me an email and I will be happy to send you a, send you a hard copy that way. All right, so what we'll do now is I see that there's a few questions here and I can, I'll read them that are on the question screen. I can't figure out how to enlarge this. I'll have to read it one line at a time. Okay, that, that one's all set. Why aren't you being consistent between truancy and chronic absenteeism? I guess I don't, that's Mitchell, so let me, I'm going to actually unmute you, Mitchell, so that you can actually ask that question, because I, I'm not understanding what you mean by being consistent. Because they include unexcused. They really? include excused absences and chronic absenteeism, but they're not included in truancy. And I think exactly. Hello. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's what I was getting at was in truancy, it's only the unexcused absences. With this, it doesn't matter if it's excused or unexcused. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. yeah, and that just doesn't seem that doesn't seem right to me. And I think rural areas get hit harder with that because kids have to travel further, medical appointments, things like that. Is there gonna be a point where you're gonna start considering 
separating excused and unexcused? Not at this time, Mitchell, no. This is Jeanette. Um, not at this time. We're going with um, the national model of calculating chronic absenteeism, which calculates both excused and unexcused absences with the understanding that if a child is not in school and is not present, all of that has an impact on that student achievement, whether it is excused or unexcused. I guess my concern is you're going to be, this is going to be posted in newspapers, I'm guessing again, is that correct? We have to report it, yes, by federal reporting requirements, correct. And then if you're a school that has a high percentage of excused absences for one reason or another, you've got to constantly explain to your public that yes, our absences are, it's high, but we have a lot of excused absences. It just, it doesn't make any sense to me. I think we should be separating them. Just my opinion. Can I, can I just add that um, just because an absence is excused doesn't mean that it's unavoidable. Um, so really where we're going is wanting you to, to have some, some tools to find ways to reduce all of your absences because just like Jeanette was saying, it really is total absences that impact a student's performance. The fact that, that an absence is excused or unexcused doesn't play into, um, doesn't play into the role that not being there um, plays in whether students are doing well academically. Thank you. Well, yep, you're welcome, Mitchell. Okay, and then I just had, oh, I forgot I'll ask it for you. <laughs> it says, what about a student who are absent 20 plus days and the parent keeps calling in saying the child is ill? Do we call this excused? In, according to the state, if a child is, is ill, that's an excusable absence, not necessarily an excused absence. You have the ability at the local level to create um, policies that would, for instance, require that parents provide doctor's notes if a child is out for um, an extended period of time. Anything that you need to do to um, control that process if you are feeling like, like parents may be um, incorrectly telling you that, that a child is sick when perhaps they're not. Yeah. As in regards to students who are designated by the school as being in the state reporting as well, or are they still, I mean, I think you answered it earlier when you said that it, you know, the absences add up and it doesn't really matter, it's going to impact their education, whether they're excused or not. Yeah, so again, that idea of excusable absences, if, if the absence, if the child is homeless and the absence is related to their homelessness, then that's an excusable absence. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to consider it an excused absence. So for instance, if your school has done everything to put um, transportation services in place and you know the family has, um, has stable temporary housing and everything is, everything is good and the child continues to be absent and you've done your due diligence and checked in um, and there's no good reason related to homelessness that that child is absent, you could consider that an unexcused absence. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I was also, I guess, referring to, you know, that report at the end of the year, you know, there's only two possible exceptions or three with the PK, PR, and the kids who are enrolled less than 10 days in a school. So I guess I was wondering if that you know, if a student is designated as McKinney Vento um, homeless, if that would impact how that is reported in that report or not. But I'm, what I'm hearing essentially is no, that it wouldn't. That's right. That is correct. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Andy, I'm going to try to find you in this. There we are right there. Okay, Andy Wallace, you, you're up. Hello. Uh, hey. I was just curious, uh, Neo. When, where is this in Neo, and when will it be there? If it's not there yet, thanks. For, for what? For what part, Andy? You said to log in, and there's a part. I'm looking in student. I'm in Neo right now. Yeah. Student report. For, yeah. Where is it in student reports? All right. You go to student reports, 
and then go yep. to verification. student data. Yep. Your student report, student data, and then you just go down here to where it says um, student attendance verification, and that will give you what you've done so far and tell you what you need to do uh, to make sure your attendance is in. Student attendance where? Under enrollment. Yep. Can you see my Oh, no, I'm not sharing my screen. Well, I am, but it's on the PowerPoint. Oh, cool. So the word chronic doesn't show up anywhere. I was just looking for something new. That's all. Thanks. Oh, no, no. It's student, it's student attendance, and the student attendance helps, helps us calculate that. All right. Great. Thank you. Yep. Hello. Okay. Renette, all set. okay. Um, referring back to when you were entering or validating what we have in for attendance, if we can't enter a zero for attendance, but we have to put in a zero for students attending a special private purpose school, will, will the designation that they're in a separate school allow us to certify with the zeros? You can't yeah, put zero. You can't enter zero. You just can't have it in null value. And so oh, a, okay. a zero is an acceptable upload or manual entry. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, Nina, I've, I've unmuted you. Do you have a question about finding the report? Uh, yeah, so I was just wondering when you show us the Excel template, if there is a specific spot on the DOE website where you can access that uh, template to input your data, or if it's just something that comes from our system, like we use PowerSchool right now. No, it's, it's on that page that I showed you under student data. If you go to our help desk page, do you have that marked in your favorites yet? Not yet, no. So I would mark the help desk page, go to resources, and okay. then student data. And it's it's right there. You can and, find it under the And to answer your question, if you use PowerSchool, you're, you're going to need to get an extract out of PowerSchool to manually to, to upload into State Synergy System or manually enter into the State Synergy System. It's not okay. an Excel spreadsheet that you're going to be entering into. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then Matthew Sear. Matthew Sear, I've unmuted you for your question. About yeah. The high okay. So, yeah. So, we're, we're a small district without a high school. We presently tuition students to seven different high schools. How come my school and not the high schools are going to be held accountable for the attendance records? Your, your school is going to be held accountable for the attendance records of the K through 8 schools. You're going to see the high school, you're going to see the kiddos. When it comes to the accountability scoring or measurement from the, the Department of Ed next fall, it was my understanding that um, all students K-12 are factored into this assessment. It's factored into the, the results the, for the reporting purposes for transparency, but your accountability, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeanette, is only going to be you held accountable for the students for which you have a school and attending. So you, okay. you don't have you don't have a high school in your district. Your high Correct. school, non-existent, will not be in the accountability model. You, and you will see, though, however, the those students that you're tuitioning to the special purpose private school or a public high school, you'll see the attendance results in their responsible section of those students. And the purpose for that is transparency for your the people that are in your district so they can see what's happening across the district for all students and where they're going to school. And you can yeah, see that, if they're... That part, yeah, I understand that part, but at an earlier conference last fall, it was explained um, differently. It, it was explained that um, as far as the accountability measurement, you know, the four-prong approach um, in the new, the new model for school grading, that um, the K-12 students and not just the, the, the pre-K or the K-8 in, in this uh, instance. We may, have so those... it. we may have discussed it, but uh, our final position was that it was just the attending schools that were going to be held accountable. K-12 students are included if you have those buildings with those students in attendance. If you do not okay. have a building that goes from 9 to 12, then your students are not in a, a school for accountability within right. your district. Then are they tagged with those schools that they're tuitioning to? Yes. Okay. Not if they're a private school, because private schools do not have accountability. No, but they don't have accountability, but they're going to see the results of the of the attendance results of those kids attending those private schools. In the reporting. In the reporting. Exactly. Not in accountability. Right. 
Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Janet Michaud, I, I have you unmuted now. Well, Hello, can you hear me? Yep, okay. we can hear you, Janet. Okay. Um, I just want to know if I do my attendance upload, which I've done one already, if I make any corrections to that data and do a new upload, will it automatically um, overwrite the data in Synergy, or do I have to make the correction both in my SIS and also... You can also upload as many times as you want. You can upload daily if you want. It'll, it'll always, until we roll over the school year, it will just continually overwrite the data that's there. Yes. Is that the question? The question is if I do a new upload with corrected data, will it accept the new um, yes. information? It'll, it'll overwrite what's there. Right. Okay. That's what I needed to know. Thank it'll you. It'll overwrite what's there for the specific student in your upload. So if you, if you have, right, if they're not in that upload, it won't touch it. Right. Okay. All right, Sherry, so I unmuted. So um, I keep hearing um, information regarding the national model. If we wanted to look for the national model, where would we look? Well, I, I probably misspoke when I said model. Probably the correct term, and it would be terminology. So attendance works has a lot of the information regarding using ten percent as chronically absent and using excused and unexcused absences. So where is that again? Attendance works is a website. It also, the chronic absenteeism part is a new section of ESSA that's where. It, that we're collecting a whole new definition replacing ADA, ADM. So if the, the definition of chronic absenteeism that we talked about is, pretty, is coming from the feds in the new ESSA law. Okay. The other question I have, and so it's an issue for our, our district, is that we do a lot with multiple pathways to meet proficiencies. And so we do have students that have excused absences who are doing learning outside of the building. So would you suggest coding that differently? But it's not that way. They may have a different educational program where they're only in the building in the mornings and in the afternoon they're doing something else. So they may have been previously marked as half day. So, yeah. so, so, so it, I'm just, it, it concerns me as far as, you know, our rates could be different. So. You know, learning, for me, this whole piece with chronically absent, um, we're talking about seat time in a building. And you can't have kids who are out of your building doing other things that um, were in programs elsewhere that we do have to actually mark them absent out of our building and they are excused and it's still going to count against us. So that concerns me. I think, the, I think the notion of seat time might be inappropriate for you, and, and you would want to look at revising your, your local policy so that you could count kids' presence if they are actively engaged in an approved um, learning opportunity that you've set up as part of your program. It sounds like you may yeah. need to have a separate attendance code that accommodates those, but like Gail said, that if they're part of their learning plan, take them outside the classroom to do to do something educational, that should not be counted against them for being absent. That should be part of being in attendance. Right. And you would just want to have some, some, some sort of accountability in place so that you could say with comfort that they're actually right. doing what, they're, well, what you think they're doing. Right? They're supposed to be there for three hours in the morning, and they're there right. for 1.5 or more hours, and they're there. Right, but they right. also do... Right. You know, if they're showing up at the other outside the school program. Right, yeah, now. you'd have to have contact with the other school to make sure they're yeah. showing up there. Does that I help guess you? That's my, I guess that's my question. If their program is only supposed to be half time in our school and they're there for half of that, we get to count that as full time? Is that what you're saying? No, actually, not quite. If, they're, if part of their program is also includes out of, out of school time, that should be included in that whole day picture. So 
if you're requiring them to, to do something outside the school, that should not be held against them to being absent, but part of their attendance picture. Okay. Thank you. Barnes. Nicole Barnes, can you hear us? Unmute yourself to ask, ask your question. All right. Well, I can ask. At the very start, Jeanette mentioned that chronic absenteeism doesn't automatically put you on the list. What list was that? A list of school support. So under the new school support model that will be rolled out this year using 17-18 data, we'll be using chronic absenteeism as one of the indicators to identify schools that are experiencing challenges and provide support to them. So it's often referred to as the All right. Kathy Harris-Medberg, I just unmuted you. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you, Travis? I'm doing well. So you had a question first? Well, I have a number of students that have some um, severe illnesses, and it's like we want to encourage them when they're healthy enough to come, and but not discourage them from, you know, like I have a child with a liver disease and another child with cancer, and when they're healthy, it's good to have them here, and when they're not, then they, you know, by doctor's orders, they just can't be in school. But they can miss a lot of school. <laughs> Would there be any exceptions for that? The accountability team has discuss, discussed having like a special considerations element to chronic absenteeism. And we're still trying to review the data to see if it's statistically significant, the number of students that miss due to medical reasons. Um, we don't want to put something in place that may cause more issue with the model. But it's something that we are discussing actively. Good. Thank you. Okay. Kim Hall, I've unmuted you. Oh, Kimberly asked, can we talk about the half-day attendance and how that will create problems with reporting? Let me see how it's going to It's not it's just an, a, a different way to think about how you record attendance. If the student is there a half a day or more, they are in attendance for the whole day for reporting purposes. If they are less than half a day, they are absent, either one or zero. So however you take attendance needs to take that into mind. Okay. So then the next question is from Nicole Barnes, and it says, uh, when a guide for attendance strategies is available, can you mention that on the commissioner's weekly message? And we have been, and anything that we have is going to be, what's that? Yes, uh, that, that note was just sent out last week with a link. How do we access the PowerPoint so that we can print it? We're actually going to hang it as soon as it as soon as we're done here. We're going to try to get it hung along with this um, recorded. It'll be you're going to put it out in the newsroom. So we're going to put it in the newsroom, but we'll probably also hang it under the student data under student attack on the help desk page. And Andy Wallace has said that if you go to ncesed.gov publish, there's a link here that you could um, go to. See what is their whole attendance is a modified day? Let's say four hours instead of six. I would say, is there any reason that this isn't correct? When we're talking attendance, it is talking the student's scheduled school day. If you have a student that only has to go to school four hours a day per their learning plan, then it's they got to be there at least two. Susan Prass asked, what do we do with parents that are taking their kids on vacation for a week or two as a learning opportunity for their child? Local decision. Yeah. The superintendent wants to count what they did for a learning opportunity. That's his or her decision to make. Right. And it wouldn't be an excused absence. It would actually be marked as present. All right. And it would be marked as present if they not an in touch each individual. Yeah. If, it, if it's approved and you're counting it as a, as a learning experience, then, then I guess they're there. Yep. Okay, would a 504 or IEP that modifies attendance set the definition of attendance for that student? Yeah, that's what you're talking about. They have, they're supposed to be there for three hours because of their IEP, and they're there for an hour and a half or more than they're there for the full day. Okay, and then uh, the medical, the illness, for long term. Um, what was the question again, Travis? It's, they want to know okay. what happens if it's an extended long term illness. How do we how do we have? They say they have no control over it for the student's attendance. So if it's an attend, if it's an extended illness, but it's 
possible for the student to be working from from home, then it might be very appropriate to have a 504 plan um, in place and some some sort of um, way for the student to continue their education from home um, through tutoring or through some sort of distance education. And if you set that up um, and have it monitored, there would be no reason why you couldn't count those days as days in attendance. Um, obviously, there'll be times when students can't participate in learning activities because they're just too sick to do that. Um, and those would count as excused absences or excusable absences um, and, and would count toward chronic absenteeism. But again, um, my expectation is that the number of students in those kinds of situations is going to be pretty small. Um, Jeanette's team is going to be looking at them, but I, I, I doubt that they're going to impact um, chronic absenteeism rates for a school in a significant way. I mean, I think that's the piece that you have to bear in mind is when right. we're looking at chronic absenteeism, we're not looking or identifying a student on any report as chronically absent. That will never be public. Any public data that's reported is aggregated to a school level. So the number of students who are medically excused in relation to the school's chronic absenteeism rate we're expecting to be pretty small. Okay, so we have one here that says, current state statute does not require school attendance until age seven. Am I wrong to see this as a conflict that we are held accountable for younger students in K or grade one? And that was asked by Matt Sear. So I can answer pieces of that. So if you're a Title I receiver, you have what's called a parent compact in place that outlines the parent expectations, the student expectations, and the school expectations. So even though by statute that student is not required to be there, by enrolling that student, you have placed certain expectations in regard to attendance. And you've also placed expectations when it comes to your school and district policies outlined in your handbook related to attendance. So those are the pieces that would be enforced. So that clear communication with parents when they register their students and enroll their students regarding those types of documentation, I think is a key element in um, having open communication regarding attendance expectations. And, and just, to, just to chime in, those students who are not of compulsory age will still not be considered truant um, because they can't be. They don't fall within the, um, the compulsory education law. But, um, but that doesn't apply to, to this notion of, of chronic absenteeism. Kathy says, thanks for providing a list. Kathy here, Smithberg. With the due dates on one list, it's very helpful and appreciated. OK, and then I have a question. The way I understand this is, if a student is present for the majority of a school day, they are considered present for the whole day. If we can't record them absent for a half day, what is the incentive for a student to be in attendance for the remainder of the day? Do we need an incentive? I mean, education. <laughs> I mean, basically, the, the, the law, the, the way S is written and the statutes that we have in place, if the student is expected to be there for six hours, then it would have to be three hours or more. They're seven hours, then it's three and a half hours or more. And that's just the way it's written to calculate the absences. There's no, I'm assuming you're not telling them that they only have to be there for half the day and then they're free to go home. Right. But I mean, right. this is just how we're right. reporting it. This, it's, this is purely for data consistency purposes at the state level. That's the only reason that, that we've drawn a, a clear line here. If there are any other questions, if you could raise your hand, I will be able to uh, electronically, yeah, because I can't see you. <laughs> All right. Well, I have, I don't see any other questions here. If for some reason we did uh, miss your question, our contact information is on the last slide, which again we'll put out in the newsroom shortly, and we'll hang this recorded session as soon as we can. And it will go out in the commissioner's update. Thank you. 
All right. So with that, it's 2 o'clock. Thank you for joining. I hope we answered your questions, and I hope you have a better idea of chronic absenteeism.